At some point, I get a bench or something, though, right? Joe, are you uh, starting your record label, Trailer Full of Bricks? Is that what's going on? That would be awesome. I I don't know. Is there a uh, is there a city code, a, a tax uh, code for for record labels? There, we may have to invent that one, Kelly. We'll work. We'll work on it. We can All have right. a commission for it. <laughs> All well, good. We have a council member that can sell it. I uh, just don't, don't <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think we know who we need to go to for that. Yeah. So you guys have um, four of you here. One, two, three, four. I can count this many. <laughs> awesome. Well, I, um, in the interest of uh, alternating, I think it was our uh, lead last meeting. Uh, we didn't have a meeting in December or January, right? Right. right. So it was uh, Trustee Poppingay. So, uh, city colleagues, I think it's uh, it's your turn. I'm happy to do it unless Josh wants to jump into the fray and lead the meeting in his first try. I'm, uh, I I will uh, let you do that, and uh, I'll sit back and take it all in, and I'll gladly tackle the next one. Thank you. Um, well, we are all here. It's 5:33, so I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. This is the meeting of the City of Davis, Davis Joint Unified School District two by two. We are meeting online as we have been for nearly a year now as a result of the governor's executive order, which allows for such meetings. Been called to order. Uh, we'll move to item two, which it, do we need to approve this agenda? I don't see that here, but is that, I don't see that here. You're welcome to. Nope, not doing it. If it's okay. not on the agenda, I'm not doing it. So we'll move to public comment. Do we have anyone here for, for public comment? I don't see anybody who's raising their hands. Nor do I. So I will close general public comment um, and move on to item three, approval of the minutes from our last meeting, which was as Joe indicated in November. Uh, does anyone have any changes they'd like to make to the minutes? Otherwise, I will entertain a motion to approve them. I would move that we approve the November 18, 2020 D, uh, two by two meeting minutes. Uh, does anyone want to second that? I will second that. Seconded by uh, Trustee Asmundson, uh, moved by Trustee Denunzio. Um, I'll do a roll call. I'll do it in that order. Uh, so Joe. Aye. You. Vigdis. Aye. Uh, Josh. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So that passes unanimously. Uh, moving us to item four, which is city district communications. And whoever wants to go first can be my guest. Don, you want to you want to have first dibs? Sure, I am happy to uh, go first, and um, welcome to Trustee uh, Vigdis Asmundson and to Council Member uh, Josh Chapman, and glad to uh, kick off with uh, the new group of electeds in this um, city and DJUSD two by two meeting. Um, I think I wanna begin with um, a thank you to the city who through the Davis Police Department has graciously donated, I think it was about $100,000 for the purchase of, through CARES funding for the purchase of 66 laptops, microphones and headsets that will uh, benefit, uh, you know, many of our foster youth, um, you know, students and homeless youth, students furthest from uh, opportunity uh, in our district. Uh, the digital divide has been a uh, major equity uh, consideration exacerbated uh, by the pandemic and the need for uh, those students to be able to access readily uh, the internet and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, district learning in a reliable way, um, you know, has really been facilitated uh, by this very kind uh, donation. 
Uh, so we'll look for ways to publicize this um, on social media uh, for sure and in other district uh, communications. But a great example of uh, the good partnership that's existed for many decades uh, between the district, the city, and the police department. And uh, thanks to Chief Bytel, um, Mike Kelly, um, and the council, uh, you know, for helping facilitate that. Yeah, really appreciate that, John. I'll just jump in really quick on, on that one. And, uh, and Deanne Machado from our police department um, was sort of running point with your team on, on that a very important project. And I'll just note that it was the funding source for it is um, uh, CARES Act funds that we received via our, our county allocation in Davis. And there was definitely a, a, a time sensitivity to utilizing the funds, number one, but also there was a, um, uh, you know, a requirement that the funds be utilized to help uh, underserved populations specifically uh, to uh, help them through COVID. And uh, this seemed like a, the perfect fit. And so really just wanted to echo John's uh, gratitude for the effort uh, goes both ways. Absolutely, it was absolutely great teamwork to identify that much, uh, uh, much, uh, needed uh, resource for those families. Um, and so, yeah, 66 laptops and, you know, headphones and so forth to help accommodate that distance learning. Uh, absolutely fabulous. So thank you so much. Most of the other pertinent district updates will come under facilities and then in uh, later comments I'll make and updates I'll provide under uh, COVID and Healthy Davis together, and there are quite a few um, on the COVID. Uh, but let me pass it over to Mike. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, and sort of the same here, a lot of our focus obviously has been on uh, COVID and Healthy Davis Together uh, efforts, uh, of course. That said, you know, city business continues forward. Um, we uh, had a council meeting last night. The city council uh, established some uh, a schedule uh, for the next couple of months uh, for its goal setting um, exercise uh, that they'll be going through starting in uh, with a focused workshop on March 23rd and then coming back again on April 6th. Uh, so we'll, uh, we solidified those dates last night with the council. Uh, so looking forward to that. And then we also, uh, the council also adopted our annual legislative platform which is something that we started doing just a couple of years ago um, in a more formal way with council to really help prioritize those uh, legislative issues that we wanna make sure that we're tracking uh, and or working collaboratively with um, our legislative partners um, and others in the, in the community to help advance, you know, whether it's legislation or helping to support a bill that uh, one of our state representatives might be putting forward or trying to advance something that's of, of particular city interest. So um, uh, I think we found that that legislative platform can really help us to focus uh, on what otherwise could have us running in 300 different directions, it helps keep us focused on sort of the top priorities that are on our list. Um, and so, yeah, the rest of our updates, I think are along the same lines, John, sort of facilities and COVID response updates. So we'll sort of hold, hold the time for that. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Is there anything else uh, anyone else would like to add on this item uh, with the caveat that both uh, um, the superintendent and the city manager said, which is that the big issues of the day are on our agenda? Not hearing it, so we'll move on to item five, which is our uh, bulk of the agenda, the discussion items. Uh, 5A is facilities and construction projects updates. So we'll start with uh, the school district. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. All well, right, let so, me introduce yeah, go ahead. for uh, Josh, and I think everybody else uh, has met Deputy Superintendent uh, Matt Best before. Uh, who's been pretty regularly attending uh, for these measure and bond updates. And you guys may know each other already, but just in case, uh, introductions. Yeah, thanks, John. Josh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Matt, as well. 
All right. Uh, so I uh, just want to give a little bit of uh, background on our bond project. Uh, Josh, I know Vigdis knows most of this already. She's been tracking it pretty closely. We started in 2018 with a uh, updated facilities master plan, which essentially set out the needs, the facilities related needs for the district. Um, all, all sum total was uh, close to a half a billion dollars. And that was in June of 2018. Um, and that was really the precursor to outline the need, the facilities related needs uh, for the Measure M bond, uh, which was passed in November, 2018. The bond uh, is uh, includes about $150 million in revenue. And then there are some other facilities related funds that uh, uh, total 75 million uh, that bring the, the total bond project to about 100, 235 million. And um, the board prioritized uh, what they wanted to have happen um, with that bond money in uh, December, 2019. Um, and really focused on the signature projects, which I'll cover uh, tonight. Um, we uh, sold all of our bonds sooner than expected. We expected to sell the bonds over a seven year window and decided to sell them all at once in April, 2020 to take advantage of a favorable bond market. We, we, we increased revenue about $3 million more than we expected um, and are gonna save the Davis taxpayers about $80 million in um, in interest fees over the over the life of the bond, and um, so what that means is we are doing a lot of projects all at once, um, and uh, they are really all going to be done by the summer of 2023, um, and then there'll be a bit of a lag where we have uh, other projects uh, coming online in 2025 as uh, additional revenue comes available. Um, we have a pretty robust uh, bond team. Uh, led by David Burke, our executive director of capital operations and some other staff that are funded by the bond. Um, and we really staffed up to really uh, get this work done um, as soon as um, uh, as soon as possible. So all of our bonds have similar project phases and you'll see these on each of the different project slides. Uh, the first is the programming slide, which for all of these signature projects has really been completed. And that's where we figure out what the purpose of the building should be. Uh, so that we can uh, design design it uh, to meet that need. Um, and uh, in the design phase, there's really sort of two components. One is where we create a schematic drawing and uh, propose placement of the building. Um, and those go to the board for approval. And then uh, we move into what's called design development, where we really work out all the minute details, uh, color schemes, uh, you know, um, uh, window glazings, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we send that uh, final drawing to the Division of State Architect, uh, which is the agency that require, that is, whose approval is required for all uh, construction for K-12 education. Um, once the project comes out of DSA review, we find the contractor that we wanna hire for the buildings um, and uh, start construction. Most of our projects have about a 12 to 18 month construction window. Um, and then at the end, we have our usual ribbon cutting ceremonies and the board does a, uh, approves a notice of completion. So we've got a couple of projects that are pretty far along. Um, the, the one that's furthest along is the early learning center um, at Korematsu campus. This is a preschool complex. Um, we will continue to have, it's uh, primarily moving from the Valley Oak campus. Um, so we will have a couple of preschool rooms at Valley Oak, but the, we're, we're uh, increasing our preschool capacity um, and really building a, a great new campus for them at, at Korematsu. Um, and we expect that project is going to be done here in the next couple months. Um, and we're hoping to have staff in there for our extended school year uh, summer opportunities uh, for preschool. Uh, the project that is the next most furthest along is the uh, Emerson uh, da Vinci Junior High School Science Lab, um, which uh, that campus was in dire needs of new science facilities. Uh, they were the original from the 70s um, that had not been updated since. Um, and it used to be a couple of weeks ago, it was a big hole in the ground, and now it is a, a not so whole, muddy mess. Uh, but that building will soon be coming out of the ground, um, and we expect that building should be completed in, uh, I think, May is when it's expected to be done. Um, the next project that is most furthest along is the uh, Birch Lane Multipurpose Room, uh, and it's been approved by DSA, 
um, and we have a contractor selected, Landmark Construction, um, and we are working on what's called the guaranteed maximum price, which is where our contractors tell us the sort of maximum amount they think it's going to cost us to build the building. Um, and we expect to break ground on that project next month. Um, all four of our MPR projects for the elementary schools are essentially the same building. They're oriented a little differently. They have uh, uh, some, some minor nuances based on the location in the school, but essentially we were looking to save money um, on design um, and construction. So we've hired the same firm, Landmark Construction, for all of the different, uh, all the four MPR projects um, and expect to save about eight to 10% of the construction costs as opposed to doing them separately. Um, so the next project is North Davis, um, and that project is currently in DSA, expected to come out next month, um, and will break ground probably in April. Uh, so about a month, it's about a month behind the Birch Lane project. Um, and this uh, project is uh, right across from the, it will be right across from the library where those portables are. Um, and those portables are getting located a little bit further north um, uh, where there's currently some grass area. Uh, Willet is also, um, we're expecting it to come out of DSA this month um, and will also break ground in April. Um, this MPR is going right where the tennis courts are um, on that uh, uh, west side of campus, right along the street side. This is, um, gosh, I can't remember what that street name is off the top of my head. Joe, I know you know this one. Sycamore. Sycamore. All right, right. I'm on mute. Yeah, Go right ahead. on the street side. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. And uh, the Chavez Elementary uh, MPR is also uh, expected to come out of DSA in March. Um, and we've got a, a few things that have to move. Um, the, the existing uh, uh, CDC Catalyst Kids um, after school program has some portables where this MPR is going to go. So we will be relocating those in the summer and um, starting construction in June. So this one will be a little bit further behind, but essentially we're gonna be staggering the contractors across all four of those um, projects. They'll move, all the subs will move from one project to the next. So this one will be sort of on the tail end there, but expected to be ready for fall. All of these will be ready for fall of 2022. Um, the next project, which is tracking pretty closely to these other four, is at uh, Da Vinci High School. Um, and this is a, um, what we're we'll calling it the tech hub, but it's essentially a, a NPR gym. Uh, it's got a new science lab. We, we received a $3 million career technical education grant. And so there's a, uh, like a multimedia lab, there's a digital fabrication lab, um, and like a media lab to do production, you know, video productions. And this is the one project where we are including solar as part of the bond. I'll talk more about solar district wide, uh, but because of the timing of the project um, and there's really no place for a solar array on that campus, um, we decided to include solar on the roof of uh, this new project as part of the bond. Um, we do have a naming committee uh, that's getting started there. The, the, um, there's some interest in naming that building. And so we have a site-based naming committee and that should be coming to the board here in the next few months. And that project, um, we're anticipating uh, uh, approval in May and um, uh, construction to start this summer. Um, the next uh, couple of projects are at Davis Senior High School. Um, and uh, these are ones that we've talked about quite a bit at, uh, with the city two by two. We had explored placing the aquatic center um, and the park. Um, and uh, these two projects are really closely connected because building at Davis High School, giving it such a, um, a densely uh, packed campus for the size of campus has been, uh, we've really had to do that in parallel. There's a STEM building uh, that's got 12 classrooms, all large classrooms. There'll be science, art, um, and some other specialty classes in there. And uh, they all have prep, prep rooms, storage, um, and that's that building that's sort of on top of the, uh, got an external uh, rendering there on top of the aquatic center. And the aquatic center um, is going to be a 25 yard by 50 meter pool, 17 lanes, um, and uh, it, it's pretty, gonna be pretty awesome. And it is really nestled in between the uh, north uh, and south gyms, uh, which are um, uh, right there sort of in the center part of campus, just south of the uh, stadium. 
And uh, these projects both have had an extensive staff outreach to, to date, uh, but community outreach will be starting later this month. So you can expect uh, neighbors in uh, around campus uh, and all of our um, uh, particularly aquatics folks around town to be uh, weighing in on their thoughts about these projects here in the, in the coming weeks. Um, we also at Davis High School have three of those career tech ed projects. Um, a, a, a new construction for the robotics team, um, which will be connected to the existing building there on the uh, southwest corner of the campus, and some um, expansion and modernization of existing facilities for auto and agriculture. And these projects have a harder deadline because of the grant, um, but we're expecting those uh, to break ground um, uh, between the spring and fall of, of 2022. And uh, this is the overall project for Davis Senior High School. Um, this may change a little bit and move uh, up in time, depending on our cash flow. Um, we're really having, because we're doing all these projects all at once, we really have to watch our cash flow uh, tightly. Um, and if when the, the four MPRs, elementary MPRs, have their guaranteed maximum price, uh, that's going to be a good, uh, good uh, budget uh, check for us. Um, and will really help us to decide whether we can move forward, uh, move up the timing and have these done uh, before the summer of 23. Uh, but we think conservatively they will be done at that time. So really all of these projects will be done somewhere between summer of 22 and the summer of 23. Uh, so lots of exciting things. The last uh, project included in the bond is what we call our project of opportunity. And it's the installation of these hydration stations all over uh, the district. Um, we've got uh, about half of our campuses uh, done and uh, continuing to install those uh, as, uh, as, we, as we can. The other uh, latest addition to our bond project is a tree master plan. Uh, the board approved uh, a landscape architect uh, at its, I think it's December meeting. And uh, that includes a couple of things. One is a uh, tree inventory. Um, so we know what trees we have around campus, what their um, health and uh, expected life uh, span is. We have some older campuses. Some of our campuses uh, are from the 50s and original plantings there. Uh, so we know we've got some trees that are nearing the end of life and are very large and will need to be um, replanted soon. Um, we want to have a palette of trees. Uh, as you've been around town in our campuses, you'll see they all have different sorts of trees um, uh, that really track the uh, decades uh, that they were built in. Um, and each uh, new bond project that came really had a different uh, idea of which kinds of trees we should be planting where. Um, and so we really want to try to standardize that um, across uh, the district. And we know we have some uh, landscaping needs, particularly around these new projects um, and a couple of our other non-bond related projects. Um, and we are expecting to have uh, public outreach across, uh, well, this will be sort of a, a district-wide, town-wide public outreach effort um, a little later this spring. Our last big effort is uh, solar. Uh, we are gonna be doing a power purchase agreement uh, for solar to offset 80 uh, plus percent of our um, energy usage across the district, which means a solar array on virtually every campus. Um, and uh, we are in the process of preparing videos for each campus uh, to do community outreach about our uh, potential um, solar array placement. Um, and that should be happening um, uh, in the next few weeks as well. So we, that'll, that'll be another one that will garner a lot of uh, uh, activity in terms of uh, uh, opinion about where, where those solar arrays should or should not go on and around uh, campus. And finally, we've got a few non-bond funded projects happening. Uh, we did the field, the, the Davis High uh, turf uh, last spring. Um, and we completed the Da Vinci Junior High School office replacement uh, just, just opened like yesterday um, on the Emerson campus. Um, we have some roof repairs uh, at Davis High. Um, we're gonna be doing some access improvement work at the district office to make sure our building is as accessible as possible. It's quite old and uh, got some challenges uh, for access. 
And uh, we've got some uh, structural floor repairs uh, at one of the wings at North Davis uh, scheduled for the summer of 22. And that's it. Thank you, Matt. Um, questions from um, anyone here, I suppose? Uh, Josh, as the person who may have been seeing some of this stuff for the first time, uh, uh, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, uh, um, I'll jump in with a quick question about uh, Cesar Chavez. It sounds like a location was was landed on for the NPR at Cesar Chavez, and it's that north is it north of campus or on the north end of campus was what yeah. was decided? yeah that's correct that's right will yeah it's on the the north side of the blacktop got it well we sure appreciate these updates and i know both uh, josh and i have kids in the district and so it's uh um, probably why we're here for one thing but uh it's exciting to see this stuff happen yeah absolutely Matt I think it's great. I mean, it's impressive that you're doing this much work um, in such a small period of time. Um, so I, you know, it's uh, my hats off to you on that. Um, a random kind of question for you. How do projects um, that are done at schools that are led by PTAs, do they, what, what made me think of it was that the tree program that you were just discussing, do those funnel up to admin or to the administrative office in any way, or are they separate in terms of their own fundraising and what they're allowed to do on the campuses? Yeah, that's a great question. So some things require uh, DSA approval, depending on what it is. Like sometimes the uh, PTA may want to do a shade structure or um, uh, a shed or some, some things like that. And so um, the way we have it set up to work is the PTA will usually be talking with the principal. Um, and when they have an idea of what they want to do, they'll bring that to Dave Burke, our director of of capital operations and we'll have a discussion at the cabinet level about are there are there other things that need to happen um and it, we uh, when we do construction on our campuses we have to use prevailing wage uh which is uh most folks are not used to that that sort of uh dynamic and uh the cost associated with it um but yes there there is an approval process sometimes it's as simple as we want to put uh tiles or do a mural we approved a new mural at um chavez just the other day that the PTA and uh, staff are working on. Got it. Thank you. Big Dis, did you have something? Yeah, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the tree as well. I thought that was really interesting that we, I didn't realize that we've got different decades of <laughs> tree history going on through our campuses. Um, I know on the Da Vinci campus, we are taking some of the, the green, some of the grass and putting in parking a lot to sort of deal with the issues with the neighborhood around it there. Um, and I am a little concerned about the trees that might come down along with that. <clears throat> um, so yeah, I'm wondering what we can do to keep those. I, I have a personal connection to those having climbed in some of those as a kid at Valley yeah. Oak myself. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we have, um, the way the parking lot is currently assembled, let me, uh, I'm gonna just pull this up real quick. Our bond website has ton of great information, uh, the sort of latest and greatest um, uh, drawings for all the different projects. So I'm gonna pull this up real quick. Uh, so we're looking at the same thing. Uh, you are. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, Vigdis, one of the uh, drivers for that parking lot was to um, try to get some more parking for students on campus because they're literally all over the place uh, around the, the Valley Oak campus, uh, which was not designed to house teenagers, really. Um, so um, the parking lot uh, currently uh, stops right about here. Um, and you can see where the sort of big trees are um, here along this line. Um, and then there's a couple more mm -hmm. back over here. We've got some carve outs um, where we expect there will be um, either new tree planting. Um, those trees are uh, nearing the end of their life. We've had a, about, I don't know, five or six years ago, we had a large branch crush car um, in the parking lot. Uh, and uh, our arborists are telling us those, those trees are, are very close to the end of their life and they are very large. Um, so we're going to need to be removing some of them. Uh, I, we don't think that we'll probably survive construction, uh, even if we just build around them. 
Um, so uh, we'll likely be taking some of those trees out and wanting to be replanting uh, to replace uh, whatever is removed. Um, so that's the plan at present. Um, uh, and I think that's going to be the, the case at some uh, as, as we're doing this new construction at uh, like at Chavez, there's a couple of mature trees that are going to need to be removed and we'll need to figure out where to where to put some new ones at. Um, yeah, our, our goal is to keep as many of our mature trees as possible if they're uh, if they're in good shape, mm -hmm. uh, which many are. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, I know the city, I know we don't necessarily have to follow the city regulations, but you know, like they have certain expectations for green cover in parking areas. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I just want to make sure that we are trying to keep as much greenery as well. I think it's important for schools to yeah. have that. That's been something we've been talking a lot about, the, especially on our new, newest campuses. The um, they don't have much cover um, mm -hmm. uh, because the trees are um, not very big, and they want to keep that um, continuity between the the grass areas and the and the blacktop. Um, but what that ends up meaning is that there's really no shade for really big swaths of land. Um, so we've been trying to, I think part of our tree master plan will be focused on that dilemma. Uh, we've been talking about that a lot about these solar arrays also, where can solar yeah. arrays start to um, uh, provide some shade in those areas where you might not want a tree, but you do want some shade. Um, and then the other thing that um, as our district has not been great at, uh, quite frankly, is making sure that uh, trees have the water they need, uh, the room to grow they need, uh, that they don't, they're, they're not in the middle of a natural walkway. I mean, you know how teenagers are, they're gonna walk the shortest distance between two places. And if a tree's in the middle of that, that tree's probably not gonna survive. So I'm really trying to get a lot more thoughtful about how we are doing our landscape design to make sure that it stands the test of time. Because uh, we've had uh, quite, a, quite a bit of trouble at some of our new, newest campuses in uh, uh, keeping trees alive uh, mm -hmm. and, and making sure they grow to be like our, our veteran campuses uh, where there's lots of great, sh uh, great shade. And Matt, if I could Good. just emphasize, oh, I'm sorry, they just. Um... That's fine. I was just, you know, I'm glad it's on our mind. I know, you know, the PTAs also can think about our shade structures and getting shade structures. And if we can do that with trees, it's much better. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it, it, it has been an important consideration um, in the solar work, and it's not the same as trees, but we do have the opportunity to, you know, to deploy solar relatively cost effectively and also provide uh, provide shade. So I think it's it's some of both for sure, but that has been a key criterion uh, for the solar uh, project. And I think you'll start, start to see these sorts of diagrams that are really conceptual. Uh, especially at a place like Da Vinci, um, now that we've got the um, the, the uh, landscape architect firm on board, where they're going to get updated with, okay, what's the actual landscape uh, plan going to be for what those green spaces in between the parking spaces are? You know, they just sort of got trees dotted around that new tech hub. That's all blacktop now, mm -hmm. uh, but really, you know, what are we going to plant there? Uh, uh, and the same for all of our other uh, NPR projects. So. Yeah, looking perfect. forward to that. It's an important part. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I was hoping that this was just really a placement and not really a picture of where trees are getting rid of and coming back. And things like that. Yeah, they definitely these drawings get more refined as we move along, uh, for sure. Hey, Matt, it, uh, or I should say, uh, Chair Arnold, if I may ask a quick question. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Matt, uh, I know this is Da Vinci is one of the sites um, where we'd had prior conversation about sort of the extension of, of parking towards the the back or the to the south, I guess. Um, yeah. And the juxtaposition to the backs of yards and such. Do, yeah. Do you have any updates in terms of where that is at in terms with neighborhood conversations and such? Yeah, we had a couple of neighbors who were uh, not happy about the the extension of this parking lot across their um, across their backyard. We've got a I think there's six houses uh, that, that would potentially be affected. I think this parking lot just recently has been truncated another round uh, to make sure we make the budget. Um, so I, I think it, it definitely, the, the, the most vocal uh, community member was here on the corner um, and the parking lot's quite a, quite a bit away from his, uh, his family's backyard, but it will uh, definitely affect these three houses and, and part of this one. 
um, in terms of its size. We also tried to bump it out a little bit further this way into the grass to minimize the amount of uh, folks who are impacted. Um, but we wanted to keep a full size soccer field there um, on campus. So that requires it sort of moving uh, you know, closer to the fence line, uh, both in the, the goal, so to speak. yeah, both in the south and yeah, right in the south nice. and uh, to the east. Well, thank you, Matt. I we appreciate that presentation. Um, any more questions or comments on this? Hearing none, we'll move on. Oh no, we have an item uh, A two city uh, um, facilities and construction. Yeah, and for this, I think we, uh, we have, so we have Bob Clark here, our uh, public works engineering uh, and transportation uh, director uh, who can talk. We, I think we had a few updates, probably very brief ones, I think, on a couple of the projects that are particularly germane to sort of the city school district interface. Um, and uh, for example, the uh, grant application for Chavez uh, with SACOG, um, just a, a brief update on that. And then any other ones I think that may have been on your mind, Bob, I'm not sure if there were others, but that one I know for sure, because we just submitted the grant application. Yeah, and the SACOG one is actually the next agenda item. So you can keep, wait, wait for that one. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. <laughs> All right, well, um, just a reminder, um, I think I've mentioned this to the two by two before, but for our, our new members, um, the city awarded a project in December that will be doing some um, safety improvements around uh, Marguerite Montgomery School on Lillard and Danbury. Um, that's part of our, our larger project, which is also building a new bike ped connection from Olive Drive up to the Poline Road overcrossing. Um, some of you may recall 10 plus years ago, there was a great deal of concern about some of our um, families with students going up to Valley Oak and just walking across the railroad tracks before UP fenced it off. Um, we also had concern about school or students uh, getting down to Marguerite Montgomery and some of the um, business areas south of I-80. This connection will provide a way for people to stay on a bike path and get all the way down to Marguerite Montgomery, as well as the shopping center there from the Olive Drive community. So we're looking forward to that starting in mid-March. I do not have a detailed schedule at the moment to let you know when they will pursue the specific improvements near the school. Um, we're anticipating that to be over the summer months, so they'll be complete by the end of August, um, when hopefully we'll be back in school for um, teaching um, next school term. So that's, that's the biggest one with a direct impact on school district interest. Um, sounds like we'll have an opportunity to update you on the SACOG application here next. Um, I'm not aware of another specific capital project that'll have a real direct impact on any school sites, but I would like to just provide a heads up that we'll be reaching out to the district, um, probably through Mike and um, um, John to look for a representative from the school district to sit on our Russell Boulevard corridor study, which we're getting ready to kick off. Um, we had a nice initial walk with our consultant team through the corridor today. The focus is the mobility along and across the Russell Boulevard corridor from A Street all the way to the West City limits. And we're well aware there are uh, a lot of school sites that parents and students utilize the Russell corridor um, coming and going from the various campuses. So we are interested in having the school district part of our um, kind of technical team to keep them apprised and make sure they're aware of what's going on as the study progresses. So I think I'll stop it right there, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And one thing I did want to add uh, with regard to the Marguerite Montgomery sort of uh, striping updates and, and such around there was that I know Bob's staff, uh, Diana Jensen in particular, I think is uh, coordinating some um, 
and some additional out, outreach and engagement around that before anything gets underway, just to make sure that everyone is, you know, apprised of what's happening, where, uh, what it looks like, what its in, intentions and intended designer for, and and so forth, because it's it's been a little while since I know we've uh, had engagement on that. So we plan to do that outreach as a follow up piece here. So. Thanks. Do we have questions or comments about stuff on the city side? Doesn't sound like it. Thank you guys for the uh, for those updates. So uh, as was mentioned, uh, item B is uh, um, the Anderson. Well, job. I, go ahead. Can I ask you just to ask for public comment? So I'm going to do public comment at the end of item five. Okay. We'll do public comment for the item for all of item five at the conclusion of the item. Perfect, thank you. No problem. Um, we'll move on to item uh, 5B, which is the SACOG grant. Go ahead, Mike or Bob. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. You can jump right into it, thanks. All right, well, I, I think uh, many here in this group are familiar with this grant. We've been um, talking with district staff for uh, many months now trying to figure out the scope of this uh, grant program. And we greatly appreciate the district's willingness to uh, be open to some on-site um, elements as part of the grant program. Uh, we submitted the application um, by the required deadline uh, earlier this month. We expect to get a preliminary response from SACOG staff late next month. And the full SACOG board will be acting on all the recommended projects in April. So we are keeping our fingers crossed, but uh, hope to get positive news on this very quickly. Um, as with most of the grant programs, SACOG is always trying to apportion uh, limited funds to many um, worthy projects. And they always ask their applicants to um indicate whether there's any scalability or phasing to the project we you know did indicate we had some limited ability to do that but i think the big um variable that we talked about with district personnel was um if we get full grant funding we can afford to deal with the on-campus reconfiguration of the existing parking lot and mitigation for that as part of the grant program. Um, if they feel the need to award us money, but not the full amount, I think it would bring into play the question, do we walk away from that um, on-campus component and just deal with improving the drop-off area and safety within the public right-of-way? Um, I'm hopeful we'll get the full amount requested though but we'll know more in about five to six weeks. Thanks, Bob. Bob, could you could you give us just a really quick summary of what it is? Well, the, the project, you know, the primary goal of the project is to just improve safety of the, the functioning along the school frontage as we're all aware at many school sites, but this one in particular, there's the, you know, the bell related traffic impacts of students um, coming and going. Anderson also is a busier than normal uh, street for most of our elementary schools in town. And is a major corridor from a lot of the uh, Northern Davis apartment complexes directly down to campus and feeding into UC Davis. So there's a lot going on there. We have a transit route, bike lanes, and we're trying to figure out how to make it safer for um, students arriving to campus, whether by foot, by bike, or being dropped off by car. And the ideal we're hoping to be able to pursue is to use the existing parking lot um, during the starting bell time as a drive-through drop-off area so we can take that um, sort of transaction, if you will, outside of the Anderson Road corridor where we have transit and bicycle and other motorists making it a less safe environment for students to be exiting cars. Um, 
you can see from this picture, there's a lot of striping and other relatively modest enhancements to try to provide a better visual cue to all the travelers where they should be, et cetera. But the big issue would be moving the vehicle drop off on site and getting it out of the uh, Anderson Road corridor. Yeah, I think that would help a lot. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, it's a zoo right there on some mornings. Um, oh, yeah. When I lived on Drake and worked at the grad many lifetimes ago, that was my commute right at school time. And it was like the shortest commute in the world, except sometimes I would get stuck in traffic. Um, yeah, it's one of the few spots, Will, in Davis that, yeah, you can get backed up for a good half mile if, if everything right. goes wrong on a rainy day. Yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, particularly the rainy days, because you you see how uh, how much the biking propensity and culture in town mitigates what the traffic, what, especially those first rainy days. I think on rainy day number five, parents are like, "Come on, just get up, just go. You're fine. Low rain's not going to kill you." But that first rainy day, the parents are like, oh, "I'll take you to school," and then everybody is in a car. Yep. When have we had five rainy days in a row, Will? I know, yeah. That was like in 20, oh, 2006 <laughs> or something, I recall. No, I don't know. Um, uh, and I think that is possibly the busiest street that there's a school, certainly an elementary school. And um, yeah. And so, you know. Um, well, thank you, Bob, and, and, and we appreciate the work on that. So we'll move now. Are there any further questions or comments on that item? Seeing none, uh, we'll move now to item C, which is COVID-19 uh, updates. Um, it says here the district will go first. Great, so quite a number of updates and I'll try to complete them as succinctly as possible. Um, so first the district has established our preschool elementary and high school hybrid models, which we would implement if uh, a set of internal and a set of external conditions are met before the week of May 3rd through 10th. Uh, the established internal conditions, which were approved at our January 19th board meeting include having MERV 13 filters in place in all our HVAC units. That's been accomplished. Uh, air purifiers in every classroom. That's been accomplished. Having uh, contact tracing, uh, quarantine and notification systems in place. That's been accomplished. Uh, making sure that our disinfectant and cleaning protocols uh, are in place. Uh, that's been accomplished. So for those variables within the control of the district to ready our classrooms for return uh, to a hybrid model, those, those are accomplished. There are some external conditions uh, which need to be in place for a return to hybrid model. Those include being in the red tier for two weeks. And the case positivity rate in Yolo County is uh, right there. That's a very good uh, number. Um, it is the number of uh, new cases in a week plugged into the, the equation that's used uh, that still needs to come down for the county to be in the red tier, and we'd like that to be for two weeks. Uh, the other external condition established is that every employee has access to the prescribed uh, vaccine regimen. So right now that's Pfizer and Moderna, and that would involve two doses uh, with up to two weeks to recover. If the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine received the same kind of emergency use authorization, that would just be one dose. But for now we're dealing with two doses. Um, there's some major news yesterday, positive news coming out of the county towards that, 
and that educators are now included in group 1B along with uh, other uh, frontline and emergency service uh, workers and including farm and agricultural workers and uh, those 65 and older. Uh, this is in part due to a partnership with Dignity Health, which is helping make available uh, a good sized number of uh, their vaccine dosage every week. The county has about 1,300 to 2,000 doses a week and Dignity Health about 800. Uh, the county is prioritizing the vaccination of employees supporting our uh, small cohort programs. We have about 30 of those across all of our campuses comprising uh, well over 250 students. Um, so that is an initial uh, more immediate step the county is taking as part of an expanded effort to prioritize educators in Yolo County uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine doses. Uh, so once we're in red for two weeks and our employees have um, had access to both doses of the vaccine and some time to recover, we are ready to return to hybrid. Uh, on per, on campus in-person learning, uh, families will have a choice about that. If those conditions are not met by the week of May 3rd through 10th, we would then remain in distance learning for the rest of the year. Uh, another important motion that uh, was passed by the board was to as quickly and safely as possible, implement on-campus activities, uh, extracurricular, co-curricular, uh, and curricular. Um, so some quick examples of that are uh, ongoing uh, athletic conditioning, uh, which has been happening uh, in some different phases uh, since March. Um, we were able to have more traditional team and equipment practices for the brief period of time we we're in the red tier. Uh, as another example, cross country was able to participate in a Sacramento County competition uh, last week um, because that is a sport where greater social distancing uh, is allowed. Uh, gardening um, at all of our school sites will likely be an early uh, on campus activity and many of our clubs such as robotics, um, black student union and some others are uh, beginning to meet uh, in uh, distant small groups on our campuses. And we'll have an update on that report at tomorrow night's uh, board meeting as well as um, status updates on uh, internal and external conditions. One of those internal conditions that's very important um, with Healthy Davis Together, which I know is next on our agenda, but I'll just include it here and then end, uh, is that we have 11 of 15 campuses set up for asymptomatic saliva testing. Montgomery is uh, in line to be the first campus to also include um, some community uh, availability for the asymptomatic saliva testing. And then we're looking to scale that up uh, once any bugs are worked out of uh, that system to allow for community testing um, on other campuses. Uh, let me turn it over to Mike for uh, city updates and happy to take any questions now or at the uh, end of this item at uh, elected's uh, preference. So I know I have a couple of questions. Um, in terms of the news that came out basically yesterday, uh, which was with regard to the red tier and the um, uh, county um, opening up its vaccine availability. Um, and that's the word that was used in the action that the board took, right? That vaccines were available. What's the definition of that? Because it, it didn't strike me as folks would need to have been vaccinated just that it was available. And I don't know what the difference is from a definition. No, that's standpoint. correct. That's correct. And a great question. And one we're getting a lot, um, not we're every getting it too. We're getting it too, by the way, right. but your former, well, I guess you may have never have been your colleague, but former uh, school board member, Barbara Archer is fielding many questions saying, no, go talk to the school board. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, let me ask Matt to take this one. Um, yeah, sure. So I, when the, yeah, thanks, John. When the board first passed the motion, we, uh, we'd been told by Yolo County Public Health that we would uh, be running a vaccine clinic or clinics in the district uh, for district employees. Um, and when we were, were sort of operating under that assumption, it would have been much easier to define when all employees have had had access. Um, since they've uh, changed course this weekend and have gone with a more sort of diffuse um, distribution method, um, that's going to be a little more challenging. We're actually meeting with our associations to talk uh, through that reality. Um, and we're thinking about it in, in two ways. One is um, regular surveying of our staff. Um, who are uh, still in need and those who have completed the vaccine. As of this morning, about almost 22% of our staff already have had one or two vaccines. Um, and about 10% are either on the fence or don't want one. Um, so we've got about 65% of folks who um, uh, you know, want the vaccine and have yet to get it. Um, so we're tracking availability through Dignity Health in the county, um, and I think in conjunction with our, our association partners, we'll, we'll define a day um, sometime here in the coming weeks uh, when we feel like all employees have at least had the opportunity to get a vaccination. Um, and we're hoping that uh, if we've got some stragglers that the, the county will allow us to do a small vaccine clinic to set a firm date at the end to uh, finalize, uh, you know, finalize that activity. So that's clear as mud, but as clear as it uh, can be at the, at the moment. No, yeah. I know. Uh, we had our county city two by two um, last week, and it, it is there's so there's so many moving parts within and of course without the county that uh, that that you know the 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 reality on the ground that we're talking about right now is different from what it was a week ago significantly. But one of the um, uh, elements that remains the same is that the limiting factor for the county is the doses that they have on hand. So they could say everybody's available, come one, come all, but that doesn't do anything. That doesn't get anyone else a vaccine. And so I, I recognize the difference between them saying that folks are eligible or that they've opened it up to then the reality yeah. of what they have on hand and are able to actually provide. Yeah, the we'll, big yeah go ahead, Joe. Sorry. I was going to say, if I can jump in, Vig just made one up as well. I, you know, I think it, it, in the board discussion, the intent was on this particular thing was to, you know, to that, uh, not to force uh, teachers or staff to get the vaccine if they didn't want to, uh, not not even if we could, which is not clear that we could, but to make it clear that they had the opportunity. Um, and as Matt said, you know, the you know our goal at the time was that we would be able to. We were preparing for, and we've actually run clinics at Harper, um, you know, for the 1A uh, medical providers that we would do something like that for our teachers. It doesn't seem, at least at the moment, unless something changes that's likely to be the approach. But um, you know, I think at some point we will have to you know, be clear that availability has been hit, that people have had the opportunity to make an appointment right now. It's probably you know, still a bit of a challenge. I was um, at Emerson uh, today doing a site visit of the small cohorts and you know, there was a teacher there while she was monitoring class on hold and she got through and they're like, yep, we got one, come tomorrow morning, you know, come to the clinic. So there's gonna be a bunch of those, you know, Virtually. folks having to keep at Maybe. it to eventually yeah. <laughs> get there. But when you do, it's like, you know, she was thrilled beyond belief and it's, you know, it's a, you know, it's an awesome moment. And, and I think uh, part of the other equation that's happened is essentially what's happening is the state is allocating a certain amount to the hospitals and then a certain amount to the county. Dignity Health has dedicated a, a portion of their uh, weekly allotments to the tier 1B folks in the county. So, so while the supply is still you know, relatively static each week, uh, the amount accessible to our employees has incre increased dramatically. Yeah, and that's great. Yeah. Um, so we're trending in the right direction right now. And as if we've learned anything over the last uh, 
year that that means absolutely nothing what the what the trends are at a given moment but um but would you say that should the trends hold in terms of both our case positivity rate and you know sort of the rate at which folks have vaccine availability um that that we would probably not hit that may go no go date i mean we're still what two and a half months from then um is that am i reading the trends correctly maybe that's the question i think you're muted john sorry if the question is given current uh trends about red tier and if the supply of vaccine um, you know, continues or improves, uh, could we be on campus for hybrid learning? Uh, sure. I think yes. that's a, yeah. yeah. That's what, that's what was when I read the news today, that was my sort of read on it. And so I wanted, I figured I was having this conversation later today. I may as well. <laughs> yeah. The ask, amount of so. vaccine being the real governor, sure. you know? Yeah. And and the good news, we were all watching the national news and, you know, in the last four weeks, the federal government has increased its distribution by what, 60 plus percent. Sure. Um, and the goal is to try to do that again in the next few weeks. So, yeah. you know, none of us control that, but that is good. You know, it's, it's your points well taken. Well, every time we think we know what's going to happen, you know, there's a twist, but right. you know, it is, you know, there's reason for a, a little bit of optimism. It really, no. I, at least I think there is. I, I, I concur. That was my read on it too. Other questions or comments from my colleagues? I know I sort of jumped right in. Bad chair move. Okay. Uh, what's next? City? City? Uh, yeah, city COVID related updates. And I can keep this pretty brief because uh, it's. It, basically the messaging is more or less status quo, you know, for the city in terms of our operations. You know, we continue to provide all of our essential services and, the, and, and then some uh, through the creativity, for example, of our parks department and delivering online programming and senior center programming and so forth. Uh, but uh, the good potential for shift to red the red tier uh, next Tuesday, it seems like that's that that may well be taking place, um, you know, based on Anne's right up in the enterprise yesterday. And then through some conversations that I've had with county reps today, that seems like it's likely to occur. As you say, the trends are heading in the direction to, to get us there. Um, and uh, we are continuing to adapt sort of our, uh, our business assistance programs, uh, working with the, closely with the chamber in Davis downtown. Uh, some of that is more directly city. Some of it is uh, uh, connected with Healthy Davis Together, which is, I know, the next one on our agenda, but um, that's been going and really starting to get its legs under it now, I would say, um, as we've had more take up of the grant programs to help businesses and with distri distribution of uh, personal protective equipment to businesses. That's going to become even more important as we get into the red and hopefully then orange and yellow tiers as businesses are able to do more indoors and have greater capacities and so forth as, as time moves forward. Um, the safe practices and the business be, businesses being in a position to support that will become that much more critical. So uh, we certainly see that. We've also been working with downtown businesses on deployment of um, sort of central tent areas uh, to provide for outdoor venues for restaurants and so forth. Um, so we continue to adapt that as the needs adjust. Um, and, uh, you know, I think really that's the primary updates, you know, for the city. Um, and, you know, I know that the community at large, of course, as Will said, you know, we've, we've sort of been on the roller coaster before going in and out of tiers. And so our core messaging and I think that of the district and Healthy Davis together, all of us has been, even with the shift, as exciting as it can be to, you know, shift from one tier uh, like purple to red and to see vaccine deployment, the core message is, you know, continued vigilance with respect to safe practices and not to let our guard up now, right? So um, that's, that's our core messaging 
you know, that we're continuing with here. So, um, Hey, Mike, just because we share a lot of uh, participants, I guess, uh, um, did you, would you let um, folks know what we're doing for summer rec programming, this sort of uh, staged approach we had talked about? Yeah, and, well, in fact, Kelly can probably speak to it even more eloquently than I can. We are taking a stage. Everything, that's the case. We already knew rec, that. Yeah. Um, and where we're doing it more, in, rather than sort of opening up all of our rec programs for the whole summer, like we normally do um, coming up here in March, uh, we're doing it more in, in, in small increments so that we can uh, try to maximize the opportunities of the potential for some of our programs being able to be offered in the summer that we know we currently, currently can't do, but maybe we can do, you know, a couple months from now. So um, Kelly, any, Thing you might like to add to that or somewhere specific you want to add? Um, I think that's the, that's the gist of it. We have had to cancel a couple of programs because the advanced planning just does not allow us to, to provide. Um, and those are unfortunately some beloved programs like Camp Puda. But um, our park staff is, our community services staff is working really hard to be able to um, probably provide a hybrid of types of activities, some things that are online and they had uh, good success last summer with um, the few programs we were able to do, maintaining strong small cohorts and following all the practices. So they have been thinking creatively and are hoping to provide as much as possible. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Great, thank you. Questions and comments from? Uh, so I have a question, Will, for uh, maybe for Mike. So um, uh, in terms of the frontline uh, service workers in the city, um, uh, which groups ha have um, been vaccinated and which are still waiting to be vaccinated? Mike? Yeah, great question, Joe. Um, so our firefighters were amongst the first, the very first group as medical, basically as medical responders. Uh, and so they were eligible right off the bat once the vaccines you know, became available. Um, and then right now, our police Police department effectively is uh, is going through uh, uh, receiving vaccin vaccinations as we speak, uh, and as Matt mentioned earlier, the dignity uh, sort of contribution, if you will, of additional vaccines to the county is absolutely helped with that. Um, so, are those uh, first responders are, are are definitely in those tiers? We do have, um, I think, like some life lifeguards and and so forth that sort of fall within some of those categories as well as far as medical, you know, response folks. Um, and some of the next ones that we're really hoping to, to get in sort of in, in the availability queue, if you will, are like treatment plant operators uh, and, and so forth, but that's not quite yet, but hopefully soon. Okay, great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Any other questions, comments before we move on? to Healthy Davis together. So so let's do that then. I'm about if I go first with a brief update and Mike is one of the co-chairs, we'll be able to give a much more uh, robust uh, presentation, but it is a, a terrific partnership and benefit for the city. Uh, we will have as part of our steps to return to campus presentation at tomorrow night's board meeting, first item, on the presentation agenda, uh, Dr. Brad Pollock and Todd Stoltz uh, providing a presentation um, about the purposes and aims of Healthy Davis Together and describing uh, the different areas that they are supporting uh, DJUSD uh, to help accelerate a safe return uh, to campus. Uh, they have been uh, wonderful partners um, the, the whole way through, and we're engaged in a number of uh, projects, um, including uh, the sampling of our MERV 13 HVAC uh, filters, uh, some surface sampling. Uh, we'll talk a little bit tomorrow uh, to learn more about um, the uh, auto sampling of wastewater, a project they're currently engaged in. Uh, with the city and how that might be accomplished remotely 
uh, on or near our campuses. Uh, they are helping to facilitate uh, a number of um, uh, programs of benefit for remote learning on campus engagement. And um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the saliva uh, testing uh, on our campuses. And we're excited about uh, the opportunity to see how we can scale that up uh, to the community as well. Yeah, great, great overview, John. Um, yeah, at Healthy Davis Together, it has many sort of branches of uh, programs to it. Uh, the ones with the school district are, are really fantastic to see unfolding. Um, all the ones John mentioned. Uh, there's a number of program areas uh, with, uh, I mentioned Healthy uh, Davis Together Business Partners or, um, program uh, earlier. That's, as I said, getting its legs under it right now with the business community. It seems to be very, very well received. Um, and, I, and I think it's going to continue to grow over the coming, the coming months. Uh, there's, of course, the saliva-based testing, which now we have three three testing sites for the community at large, including Mondavi Center, our Senior Center, and our Vets Memorial Center. Um, so three, three locations in addition to what John had mentioned as the, the that's more specific for the school district uh, sites that's, that's in play. Uh, and really the messaging there, the big focus the last several weeks has been around really trying to get people out and get tested as a primary means of stopping spread uh, at this point, I think they've uh, surpassed the, I think the eight, I know the 800 mark, maybe even the 1000 mark of people who have been identified through the HDT testing program as having COVID or testing positive for COVID and not otherwise knowing that they had it or being asymptomatic. And so that's one of the biggest tools to stopping the spread is providing the knowledge to someone that they are carrying it and but just may not be exhibiting symptoms or have very mild symptoms. And so that has been a tremendous statistic that has come out of this that I don't think we were expecting. So it's a very powerful tool, the free testing. It's very, um, I will say also rare to have access to something like this um, anywhere. Um, and so we're really trying to get the messaging out um, and I'm sure all of you can help at some level uh, with encouraging people to come out and do it. If you haven't done it yourself, it's um, it's about as easy as it could possibly be. Um, so I imagine most people, if not everyone has probably done it. Um, We've so, done it with all the kids a few times. If, if, I could, if I could add, they've also really started to work with the um, student groups. So sports groups um, and yeah. you know clubs, things like that and try to provide uh, gift card incentives or um, other sort of incentives from the program if the students go and get tested once a week. And the idea is that those students will bring their families with them, et, et cetera. So it's kind of a, hopefully a win-win-win. Exactly. I got, I got an email from those, the athletic boosters uh, about, yeah. you know, what a, fun, a fundraising tie-in with the testing uh, incentive. Yeah. Yeah, they're really, they're, they are doing some experimentation with sort of the incentive programs as well to see sort of what works and what what doesn't in terms of getting getting folks out. Um, and uh, so that'll continue. Um, the testing too, I will say, um, it's not particularly advertised as such. When we first started the testing or HDT first started the testing program, it was very specific about being for asymptomatic people only. I will say that they are taking symptomatic people at the HDT testing sites. They have a little sep a separate area where they will, when they go through their questionnaire of like, hey, have you had any of these symptoms lately? And if you say yes, you will still get a test um, on site, but they, it's just in a little separate area so that there's a little more separation. Um, and the turnaround uh, in those cases, I've seen it within hours, not even 24 hours, but within hours, they're getting some test results back. So um, is that I, still saliva tests or is it a different kind of test? Uh, no, it's, um, the nasal, it's a na it's uh, nasal it's test. A nasal. You got to get serious it's, about it. If you it's not the back of the brain one. It's, oh. uh, yeah. it's a less invasive one. <laughs> normal. It's normal. Right. right. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, I know of someone personally uh, today who um, was, you know, wanting to get tested, was, was not feeling particularly well, um, said, oh, I'm not going to, I can't go get tested now. I said, no, go, go show up and, and tell them what you're feeling. And they quickly sort of routed the person to the symptomatic testing. They had the results back today and they did not have COVID, right? but they said, hey, quarantine for or isolate for three days come back do it again and let's make sure so um because it can take a few days to incubate so but in any event it's probably they probably don't have it but based on that but it's a incredibly powerful tool really trying to get people out to do it um the effluent testing john mentioned uh in addition to sort of the air filter testing with the district uh effluent testing uh, is being coordinated uh, with, with the city and campus uh, for our wastewater stream, um, it, which is, we're the only community um, in the nation, probably the world, that's doing it. Um, and so it's pretty innovative. I know the university is extremely excited about just the ability to try to try new things that uh, could be very instrumental in our communication with our community. Um, if, we're, if we're seeing uh, data that suggests that we want to do some, some sort of targeted outreach. Um, and, but moreover, it could be very instrumental in, um, you know, heaven forbid future uh, pandemics and outbreaks. A lot of this research from Healthy Davis Together is going into and being documented so that we can identify best practices for, you know, like I said, heaven forbid, whatever the next COVID is, you know, hopefully not in our lifetimes, but um, yeah. Anyway, so, uh, and then a couple other quick things, um, quarantine and isolation, so, and personal protective equipment, those are additional aspects of the program that have been, I think, very successful, distributing free, distributing free PPE to businesses, to the community at large, uh, and then we have quarantine and isolation um, units, living units um, in the city and on campus uh, that people have availed themselves of. Um, through the program. Kelly is very familiar with it because she's been literally hands-on and helping with our, <laughs> our staff on, on implementing that program. And I, I, we, we've had people in apartment units this week, you know, uh, utilizing that program. So, and it, they've been utilized on and off um, uh, throughout. So it's been just outstanding. So that's a brief update. One last point on vaccines in Healthy Davis Together. So UC campuses are going through their own vaccine distribution program. Uh, the UCs uh, are basically taking an approach of providing vaccines uh, when they become available. I don't think they've had very many available as of yet. It's like in the couple of hundreds, you know, for UC Davis, it's not huge numbers, but the UC system has a, a plan and a program in place for providing uh, vaccines to, to their students. Um, and I think they're working to extend that to staff, you know, faculty as well. Um, and, but Healthy Davis Together specifically is partnering with Yolo County to leverage the Healthy Davis Together resources in whatever way they can to help the county deploy vaccines. If we say, for example, at Mondavi Center, campus has some space available and ready to go at the Mondavi Center, should the county say, we need another uh, vaccine delivery location, can you help? Then Healthy Davis Together is prepared to say, absolutely, we will help. Whether it's with staffing and people to administer vaccines or space or both, um, you know, with uh, all, all manner of resources. So the Healthy Davis Together is really making a point to be a partner with the county on countywide deployment of vaccines. That's that's all I had. Thank you, Mike, for that update. Um, questions and comments? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Do you know if the, um, the three sites are like testing at capacity or could they do more people than they, they have right now? Great question. They are not testing. They're not using using the full capacity um, of the sites. Um, you know, with all the we're wanting to make sure that we message and and try to utilize as much of that capacity as we can. 
but they're we're still well below the the capacity uh, limit. The genome center, I think, right now can run eight thousand tests a day. Um, the between the three testing sites, they, I think, theoretically would have the capacity to administer that many tests, but we don't have anywhere near that number coming through. Um, but we're hoping that with some of these programs and with the school district partnership and uh, and so forth, that the numbers uh, jump up. And you said you'll have Dr. Pollock at the board uh, tomorrow. That's a great question to get because our number that we had presented to us was from about a month ago in terms of how many we're, we're they're seeing and how many uh, they have capacity for. There may be an updated number uh, that he has anew for, for you folks tomorrow. Cool, thanks. Um, I, I, I didn't realize that, that you guys do a symptom survey. I've been doing it on campus and you have to do the symptom survey to go on campus, but for the ones at the city, they also do a symptom survey and then they can funnel you at that point. Uh, it's, it's for anyone going to one of the Healthy Davis Together saliva testing sites. Um, they'll, the, when you're in line to go in before you enter the building, they will ask you a series of questions like, have you had headache? Have you had sniffles, sneeze? You know, and if you answer yes to any of those, then they say mm, you could be symptomatic. Mm -hmm. And at, before they would say, we're not testing symptomatic. Please go see your doctor. And yeah. now the, the protocol is, okay, let's simply divert you to this other area of the testing site and we will give we'll administer a different kind of test yeah. the the nasal test yeah cool and then the for the quarantining and the isolation is that are, are you guys funding that with like cares funding or wasn't it part of a project that was already in place prior to the pandemic am i mixing those up yeah it's it's it is funded uh through healthy davis together that we do so okay. what we do have a uh, biggest what you may be thinking of is our rotating winter our well, it's not rotating this year. Our winter shelter program, uh, which is for generally speaking for homeless population during the winter months, um, we are funding that with some CARES Act uh, funding this year. And it, this year it's in apartments as opposed to church sites and it's not rotating. <laughs> so amongst the church sites. So we do have that, but separate from that with Healthy Davis together, we have, um, apartment units that are being uh, basically, you know, fully furnished appointed apartment units that are being funded through Healthy Davis Together uh, yeah, funding. And that's and and then just also the, oh yeah, I was just gonna say, there's also the, uh, the Project Room Key, uh, which is hotel rooms that are being, that have been made available really throughout COVID, uh, again, through CARES Act funding in the county to provide hotel room availability to um, homeless population as well. There are also um, the quarantine and isolation program for Healthy Davis Together also has a quarantine component that is in local hotels, which is different from the isolation component, which is in the apartments. So we're trying to cover all the bases. So then how does somebody access that? Is that for like available to anybody that needs to quarantine or? So if uh, it's, bas it's basically we're partnering with Communicare and so the when you go and you get the testing, the Healthy Davis Together testing folks um, will contact Communicare and then it funnels through that way. Um, or somebody could go onto the, you know, the website and contact Healthy Davis Together and ask for assistance. Cool. Thanks. That's it for me. Other questions from folks or comments? So, Joe, you need to be. Uh, Sorry. Need to be. Yeah, again, with the mute thing. Uh, it's, we've only been doing this for 11 months. Um, so uh, just one comment related to this. Uh, so we had the pleasure of having um, Congressman Garamendi uh, with a town hall uh, at the chamber today that I helped moderate. And um, he, uh, I think the one of the big highlights from that conversation was his optimism that the COVID relief package that's working its way through Congress, which is probably a kind way of putting it, um, is, is going to pass um, through reconciliation. Um, and he wanted to point out that it includes $350 billion in, for state and local governments um, and cities of you know, the size of Davis will be qualified this time through 
um, and about $130 billion in support for K-12 uh, public school districts. Um, so, uh, you know, not done yet. Uh, it seemed like, you know, he, he, his belief was sometime in the first half of March. Um, so maybe a few weeks from now, but it was, uh, it was just good to hear that uh, optimistic uh, point of view about the, the the next COVID relief package. Yeah, we're tracking we're tracking that very closely, and and you see all of our fingers crossed and <laughs> toes and everything, right? <laughs> yeah, it would be uh, fantastic because so so far, I will say, cities, especially cities our size, uh, the smaller cities, smaller and medium sized cities, have not been direct beneficiaries of the, those those relief packages. So. Uh, hope springs eternal. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's good. Indeed. That's a good update, Joe. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll just, uh, if there's no more comments, I'll just say very quickly, it's, um, uh, you know, we're all very proud of this partnership and, and, uh, and fortunate to have this partnership with UC Davis. I know we talked about it at um, our goal setting framing meeting last night, um, how we, one of our goals is uh, health safety or healthy safe and equitable community I think is what the goal is and and how the pandemic has really changed my vision I think our community's vision of what health means uh, and what a, a, a city's responsibility opportunity to to help facilitate the good health of, of our uh, community members mean uh, you know i think we thought it meant sort of core city services like you know having clean water and 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 having something good happen when you call 911 but the fact that we're you know a major driver that healthy davis together is a major driver toward our county going into the red tier that it's a key component of um of the school's reopening um and that plan is it, we're just so fortunate here in davis so I will say that um, if there's no other um, comments from members of the body, I will um, take this opportunity to invite members of the public to make comment on any of the items we discussed here in item five. Kelly, do we have any public, pardon me, do we have any public commenters? There is one person with their hand raised, Jeremy Taylor, if you will um, unmute yourself. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you. I can unmute myself, but I can't unmute the baby here. Um, long story short, I think you guys are doing an awesome job. What I wonder, though, is are you maybe overlooking some of the things that are right in front of your eyes in terms of the school district, how to get students back up and running and actually make up ground? I mean, you're talking about students that are going to be further behind when they go back into school than their last regular day of school. So we're talking making up over a year. And what are you guys doing with the businesses. I, I like to hear that there are some, there's some collaboration, but people have had their livelihoods completely ruined in this city. And I, I like that you guys have all memorized statistics, but I hope to see the same level of energy and actually putting tactics on the street to actually get things done. Pie in the sky ideas sound great, but let's actually talk about things that makes, that makes the wheels turn. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for your public comment. Um, do we have any other members of the public, Kelly, that are indicating a desire to comment? That looks like it. Okay, then I'll go ahead and close public comment for that item. We'll move on to item number six, which is general announcements, comments from, um, from any member of this body. Do we have any such? I hear silence, the sound of silence. So, uh, uh, with that, I will um, go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting. Uh, 7.01 p.m. is our time of adjournment, and I want to thank uh, uh, everybody for your participation, and I want to uh, um, uh, welcome uh, Vigdis and Josh to this body, and, uh, and I look forward to working with you guys uh, um, uh, over the course of the next uh, couple of years. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat> Have a great night. Thanks Thank you everyone. all. Have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.